So it sounds like this life history stuff has a lot to do with vulnerability to certain diseases. Yes, and I think that one of the main areas of insight is going to come from this connection between early life reproduction and late life vulnerability. In other words, evolution has acted to make organisms really highly functional and effective early in life when they're reproducing, and it has been, quote, willing, unquote, to pay a cost in terms of late life vulnerability. So what we're now experiencing in the post-industrial world with the survival of people into greater and greater ages is an exposure of these vulnerabilities. Previously, uh, evolution had shaped us in ways where we didn't have to pay those costs. We died from infectious disease, we died from getting eaten by predators, we died in warfare. So I've heard from many doctors that they say natural selection is really not relevant because um, for everybody died by age 30. Did everybody die by age 30? No, everybody didn't die by age 30. The average life expectancy at birth was 30, but if you lived to be 20, it was likely that you would make it to 60. Was aging faster? No, I don't think aging was faster. I think what was going on isn't that people weren't dying from aging. They were dying from, uh, for other reasons. And what that did was it meant that aging could evolve as a buy now, pay later plan where you didn't have to make the subsequent payment. <laughs> okay, so this is awfully relevant aspect of life history theory to disease, aging and all of its complications. When we say aging, it sounds like there's kind of a mechanism of aging that gets turned on. Is that the right way to think about it? No, not really. I think you should think of aging as a diffuse uh, erosion of our body's ability to maintain itself that happens in many different systems across the body. So there's, well, there's a lot of data ages back about how the decline was really consistent across all the different organs. The liver and the kidneys and the eyes and the heart all declined at the same rate, which made people think there was some central control system. Well, no central control system has really been found. There are some things that do have effects on several organ systems. But I think the take home message from what we understand about the evolution of aging is that we can expect every person to be aging in a slightly different way and that if we manage to fix one of their problems, another one will pop up. So what would you think about identifying genes that make some people age faster and knocking them out and getting rid of them? Well, I think that you, what you would find is that those genes were doing something else that was really quite useful, or they wouldn't have been there, and my suspicion would be that those genes were doing something very important early in life. Mm -hmm. And George Williams, of course, gave this classic example of a gene that made your bones heal faster early in life and also caused calcification of coronary arteries. And since not very many people are alive to have calcification of the coronary arteries cause much harm, that gene gets selected for. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually looked for that particular effect in reality, but it's a wonderful example. Well, I know of one that people have found. Uh, you know, when uh, we're very, very young, when we have just started life as zygotes and we divide into a few cells, we become a thing called a trophoblast. And we float down the fallopian tube and into the uterus, and our first job is to implant into the endometrium so that we can get nourishment from the mother. Convince the mother that we're good stuff. Yeah. Well, at that point, at the point of embedding into the endometrium, it's very advantageous to have a certain version of a gene called TP53. And if you've got that, you implant really well and your early life is great. However, that version of the gene uh, creates a risk for cancer hmm. later in life. And I can't imagine anything happening much earlier in life then a trophoblast trying to implant into an endometrium. And that really influences your fitness because if you don't grab on, If you don't gone. grab on at that point, you're gone. So mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of things like that and we just don't know them yet because that very early biology is all happening inside the mother and it's not so easy to explore. So do most babies have this TP53 or only some? Uh, very few babies have the version of the TP53 that increases the risk of cancer that much. In other words, it appears that the cost was significant enough that the benefit, in most cases, did not outweigh it. Interesting. So most of us are not at risk of cancer for that reason. So for doctors trying to understand the reasons for disease, it sounds like there might be yet other ways that life history theory might illuminate things. Are there other examples that come to mind? Well, I think one of the things is really from evolutionary theory in general, and that is that 
evolution is operating most strongly on the parts of a population that are doing most of the reproduction because that's how the genes get into the next generation. And usually that's going to be the, what we would call the normal people. They are in the middle of the population distribution on a lot of things. But their performance is made up of a lot of different factors, and each of which can vary, as a result of which the whole population, when you look at it, consists of a large range of different kinds of people. And the ones that are way out on the tails are not really contributing very many genes to the next generation, which means that evolution is not really stopped if that tail of the distribution is expressing a pathology, an illness.